What's up, everybody, and happy Wednesday. Welcome to another episode of Indeed. It's the Independent Wrestling Podcast. I'm Mike, here as always with my wonderful co-host, Righteous Reg, to talk some independent wrestling with your favorite faces from around the world of independent wrestling. How are you doing today, Reg? You are muted. <laughs> Been there. Hey. Am I muted? Am I alive? Am I here? You're alive. You're hey, alive. It's me. It's Righteous Reg, your favorite writer, your favorite writer. Burr, your favorite podcaster here, independent wrestling. Uh, this one's a, a really good one, I think, today, Mike. Uh, we've had some very special guests the last couple of weeks, but today we have someone that uh, is a little bit deeper into some things that we like here on Indeed, and so I'm very excited to talk to our guest here today. Absolutely. And, uh, and he's gone. <laughs> <laughs> hey, it's okay. We're we're here, we're here to talk to you and not Coda, although we love Coda. We love Amazing. them views though. Um, but uh, yeah, our guest today has uh, you, you know, has many names: the Death Fighter, uh, the MLW Middleweight and Tag Champion, mm. uh, your dream waifu, uh, Maid Kira. Oh God, yeah, that, that's a new one. <laughs> and, uh, yeah, we do have Akira here with us, and uh, thank you for making it here. The internet told me Speedball Mike Bailey broke your back, so it's a miracle that you're alive oh, and we're yeah. moving and sitting up here. You're, you're alive. You're upwards. You're not in a hospital bed permanently. Yeah, you know. I want to be perfectly honest. Like my back, we've all seen me do a German suplex. Like my mm -hmm. back bends that way. It's not a big yeah. deal. Yeah. Literally three days later, people were asking me if I, if I was hurting. I woke up and I just. You know, you need to stretch your legs. You pull, you stretch your arms out. As I stretch my legs, all you heard is this, <laughs> and I just go, oh. And Masha goes, here's, here's the thing. She goes, what? And I go, my leg. And not from the match, not from anything, from waking up and stretching, exactly. I couldn't walk for a week and a half. No. That's, that's my life. I don't get hurt in matches unless it's, you know, this, mm -hmm. or you get your face cut open. But, uh, Literally, the only time I ever get hurt is, is something dumb at home or in the, in the gym, just a little minor injury that I have to deal with for like a month. It definitely thinking about that is just that I still get tagged. I'm, I'm going to get tagged in that clip from that match forever. I just one thousand percent, yeah, it's forever. <laughs> Absolutely, so like that match, it's, it's either that or the Matrix, the Matrix spot that happened in that match. Everyone was mm -hmm. like, Whoa, yeah. It's, one of those two, but we all know it, the the double knees is what everyone's going to be talking about forever. Yeah, but like that's not even the first time. Like you've had a few moments from uh, from from your matches go viral, like for various reasons. Um, you know, and the exposure is always great, and the discourse is usually stupid. But like my my favorite was uh, at Prestige when it was either me popping out of the box, Metal Gear uh, Solid style, yeah. or when I had Sonico and I charged at the Rome camp, stopped, and I lariated at him. And Lee Moriarty did some like '90s uh, family sitcom music over it. And it was just, I was like, "That's that's perfect." That's that's been my favorite viral moment. People will think the roof jump maybe with the lights. I'm like, "No, no, 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 no!" It's the lariat because it was yeah. a total '90s sitcom, and it was. I I watch it. Like, it's so funny. Yeah, no, the silly like the silly ones are way better when people like the ones that people can the ones that people can like grab shit, add effects to, and stuff like right. that, oh, yeah. like. That's where that's where the true memory comes out. Well, it's the memory, but it's also a it's a reflection of your character because a lot like you'll see guys uh, do a move, like a really crazy move, and it's like that's cool, but it, it doesn't really go outside of wrestling except for like you know some crazy Ninja Mac thing mm -hmm. where you, you watch that and you go how or Vikingo you go out like I watch Vikingo and my body hurts just by watching him. <laughs> My knees hurt by proxy. I, I was, uh, I was standing with, uh, I think I was standing next to like Nick Gage or somebody. We were, I was just talking. I was like, you know, I watch Vikingo. My knees hurt. He goes, me too, dude. Yeah. <laughs> um, but I like the ones with, where it's the character. It's the little character. That's why, like, why Danhausen got so big to me. I think was because he just had a character outside of wrestling that people just liked, and he just did really interesting things that people can clip and just share everywhere. Warhorse, you know, like all those guys. Um, and I'm in that I'm in that weird line of where I'm not really overtly a character character. 
you know, like some guys are. I'm, I like to think I'm a little bit more like nuanced. I'm not so much as like, you know, a, a 90s cartoon. But I, nowadays I can kind of say I'm probably like a 20, a 2009 anime Especially now with the maid thing, like I, I can't, I can't say I'm not a gimmick character now with that. I go, Ugh. <laughs> like some, someone said I should have a a, a Titan Tron where it's me, but I go through a whole magical girl sequence and I go, I, I'm just, oh I'm just this. I'm like, are, you gonna, are you gonna pay for this? And they're like, I might. I said they should pay for it. I'll do it. It's fine. <laughs> right. Yo, I'm sure we could crowdfund that. Like, <laughs> we'll, we'll, we'll just clip this. We'll keep retweeting it. But I, we could probably make a it lot better. of people are gonna be interested in that for sure. Yeah. I, yeah. I didn't think it was that big of a deal. Um, because like the whole made thing is just like it's it's something not. For, it was something for my Twitch fans, but it's something mm-hmm. I also I kind of wanted to do for um. The more like the more feminine side of me, I wanted to embrace that because people thought I'd do it with, like with a beard, like Lady Beard from Japan, mm-hmm. and you know in that in that band. And I was like, no, 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 no. I'm gonna come out of this looking so pretty. Y'all are gonna be fucking confused. And literally, like the, I, I saw Effie on was it on Sunday, and Effie was just like, how does it feel to be so pretty if you're a man or a woman? And I go. <laughs> Bitch, I feel great. <laughs> <laughs> killer, killer Kelly walked. Killer Kelly walked up to me, and it was just like, because she's like, when we were in Germany, she jokingly became my adopted mom, and she just looked at me. She's like, I don't know what to think of you. You were, she's like, you were about as pretty as I am, and I go, mm, that's mm. so good. Masha's mom didn't even recognize me. That's the best part. That's awesome. So I, I got, I got all, I got all fixed up, and she was talking to her mom about something, and her mom sees it, and she goes, Mom, look. And she stops and goes, who's that girl? <laughs> and I'm like, when? And then I go, yo. And she's like, Akira? And I'm like, hi. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and she, she just laughed. She's like, you look good. And I, I, I didn't expect this dainty little Russian woman to, th- to say I look good. And I'm like, yeah, it's a win. There you go. You, 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 you've, you've ascended to f- can fool your in-laws pretty. Oh, yeah. yeah. I am... I'm 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 trying to be like Effie, and I'm trying to hit like uh, low tier sex god levels, and that's yeah. just kind of what I'm pushing nowadays. Right. I got the earrings and the nose piercing. I got everything. <laughs> Let's go. Like this when you when you did your maid care stream the other day, they're like that stream popped the fuck off. Like there was the the right. wait, like the chat in the waiting screen was mm-hmm. like it busy was, as hell. I, I went from having like maybe twelve to fifteen viewers. So like when I started this year. I was hitting, you know, eight to ten consistently. But when I started b- being much more focused and focusing on presentation, um, much more chat involvement as well, I was hitting around like twelve to fifteen. You know, like if I and I, if I, I, don't, I don't really announce my streams, people just know. He's, in my Discord, the, my moderators go, "He's going to stream when he wants to stream. Just be ready for it." Mm-hmm. And I'll pop up with like twelve to fifteen people. It doesn't matter what game I'm playing. But if I'm playing like Civilization, I'm getting up to 20. But when I was doing the Mage stream, um, and once again, it's I, I know it's not going to be like an open. I got up to like 30, 35 people consistently for like six hours. Mm-hmm. And considering I streamed for 13 hours, and by the end of the stream, I was still like 19 to like 18. I'm like, that ain't yeah. bad. And, oh, right. and, I, and I incentivize it now just because like, it, yes, um, doing the feminine stuff is like a part of like, me for me personally and it's a good representation for myself and it's a good representation for you know people that are lgbtq but i'm also like y'all ain't gonna get it just like i'm not gonna panhandle that to you so i said i'm like so now i'm like every 250 followers you guys get a stream and i told them the next one is going to be magical girl so they got really excited for that one and i said it's gonna be i said it's gonna be shark powered magical girl and Mm -hmm. people were like my 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 moderators were like already already planning stuff for that stream. They're like, we're on it. Let's go. Yeah. It turned into its own thing, like merchandising, um, merchandising character stuff. People asked if I'll if I'll wrestle as the death maid, and I go, yeah. Like, why why wouldn't I? Like, right. It's it's fun. It's it'll it's, it'll be a, a a different character with kind of the same things, some same things uh, as Akira, but it's also different. Like her name is Kira. She does her own thing. Oh, also, uh, what was it? Paro. Um, I was talking to Paro, and uh, Paro was like, "Yeah, my husband saw it, and he's like, holy shit, he looks really good. He could, he, like, he looks like he's doing like drag professionally.'" And I'm like, "Perfect." <laughs> <laughs> I'm getting compliments go. from all sides of the aisle. Mm-hmm. But when you get guy, when you get like the, the crazy deathmatch fans going, 
I have the most confused boner right now. I go, that's the point. And hey. like, I, I thought people were people. I thought people were gonna like crap on this. But you, I mean, you guys know th- those Facebook deathmatch groups are insane. They're yeah. filled with crazy people. Yes. Um, and I really, I, I'm tapped out of the deathmatch scene just because I don't need to deal with that. I don't, I don't talk about XPW. I don't talk about anything. I focus on wrestling that I like, people that I like, and that's what I'll be. I don't want to be. I don't want to cycle that kind of negativity. Like. But when I, when it, there was maybe one person who said something and everyone else was just like, shut up. Like he actually looks really great and he mm-hmm. can kill all of us. And I'm like, you get it. You guys understand. Absolutely. <laughs> um, and yeah, so oh, where was I going to go here? Um, <laughs> I talk a lot. I'm sorry. <laughs> no, <laughs> no, it's, it's perfect. No, no, no. It's okay. Um, mm-hmm. But yeah, you know, you said like you're having, you know, you're having fun with it and mm-hmm. kind of just embracing all sides of yourself. And it kind of yeah. takes me back to uh, earlier in this year, you did uh, IWTV, The Life Of. Yes. And uh, there was this moment in it, uh, you had a monologue in your car um, yeah. and you made a lot of statements. And I think your current successes are really reflecting uh you know what you said there so i, I kind of want to get some of your insight on that uh like you talked about investing free time into yourself uh and mm-hmm. so you know what kind of work have you been putting in on yourself and uh how are you finding that to be paying off um i'm just so i when, when i where i came from um i came from the middle of nowhere in indiana my mom was a uh was a korean immigrant um and she korean japanese you know that the whole background of there is so muddy and i and the history is so kind of messed up i really don't bring it up i go listen this is what it is other people understand like other other agents go we understand we know what you're talking about i go cool but my mom and my dad were very limiting in things that i wanted to do the things i wanted to be that kind of thing like i wanted to do jujitsu i wanted to do taekwondo that kind of stuff my dad was like yeah you're my dad's like standard six foot four white american he had a mullet in the 90s the whole nine yards um but he there he's like like, no you're gonna play football you're gonna do this you're gonna do that and all of my life i kind of just listened to what people said i'm going to do uh, or what i should do and i just you know that that was that was the barometer of my life was listen to other people um because i there you don't it was like you don't have free will that kind of thing Mm -hmm. I went to college. I didn't go to college for things that I wanted to do because my parents were like, we're paying for it, so you have to do what we want. That that whole spiel. Mm-hmm. Um, I graduated college, and it's, it's only because I went to co- the college that they wanted me to that I made the friends that got me back into wrestling. So by proxy, it worked out for me. Um, but I I went through life. I was working like in factories and whatnot, and I I hated I hated my life. Like I, I was I had carpet on both hands, so I'd wake up every morning and my hands would be like this. And every morning I had to flex and get functionality back. And I was just in pain for months, more pain than I've ever been in wrestling, which sounds crazy, but it's true. Like factory work is the worst, especially when they don't care about you. But it goes towards what happened this year of where I decided I'm going to take, I'm going to do things that I wanted to do where I was like, I, I want to be a wrestler. My parent, I was, wasn't really allowed to do that. My parents were going to support me, but I said, I'm going to do it. And I did it. I, I paid for the training on my own. I drove three and a half hours one way, slept on my trainer's bed. And by on my trainer's bed, I mean at the foot of his bed because the rest of the house was so gross. And I'd go back and forth every weekend, three and a half, three and a half hours. I'd stay at his place just so I could train. And I people will say, that's kind of sucks. I said, no, I'm happy because I did all of that to get to this point. Mm-hmm. And this is the year where... I mean, I would still listen to promoters, you know, you get the promoters in your ear saying, no, you need to do this. You need to do that. And that's why I always admire Effie for, because Effie has always been very, I'm going to do what I want. Like I am, I am the product. I'm the commodity. You want to use me. Right. Right. Like it's not, it's not, you have power over me. It's I'm giving you the fan base. I'm giving you your money. People pay to see me. They don't pay to see you. They don't pay to see you book. And this was the year where I truly decided, you know what? I don't need to be chained down to these places. I don't need to be chained down to other people's opinions of me or what they think I should be doing. Like, I bet a bunch of people would be like, if I told them about the maid thing, they'd be like, it's stupid. Mm-hmm. But now people want to see me wrestle as the maid. Literally, Effie saw me and Effie said, what you're doing is so smart. He's like, it's, it's you, it's personal, it's real. But in terms of marketing it's so good Mm. and i'm doing that with just myself like people were saying don't sign with mlw and i said you know what i'm gonna do it because i i went to them 
I told him what I wanted, what I'm going to do, and we discussed it. And I've been having a great time there. I just I said I'm going to go. People are saying, "Oh, don't try to go to Japan without us because you know we." We were in this together, and I'm like, no, 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 no. We're not in this together. I am my own separate brand. I am my own separate entity. I'm not tying myself down. I'm not being loyal to people who don't pay me enough to be loyal. And people again were like, what, what, what are all that we've done for you? And I'm like, there's a lot that you've maybe you've done for me, but there's a lot that you've done that have really like just brought me down. And like the past year and a half, I did not like wrestling. Um, I'll even outright say it. Uh, when I wrestled uh, G Raver at GCW. I didn't know he was high on meth, and I put my life in his hands, and I had probably probably one of the worst matches I've ever had. It went on too long. I was so confused because I didn't know what was happening because I didn't know he was high. I thought he was upset because our friend died. When Marcus Crane died, I was fucked up. Everybody in that back was crying and fucked up, and I let it go because I said, you know what? He's probably just sad. Then I find out by proxy, no, he was high as shit. He's been high as shit. And I let that man drop me off like a 20-foot ladder onto another ladder with light tubes. That sounds yeah. absolutely insane out of yeah, pocket. That's crazy. that's crazy. And I forgave him before that. And I said, you know what? I'm tired of just forgiving for people for, for crap. I always put my best foot forward 100%. I'd give my heart out. And that match messed up a lot of things for me, and it messed with my head. The past year and a half, I'd had good matches, but I was never, like, proud, you know? Mm. And... I get. I had to get to the point where I had that the match uh, with Tremont, where I cut the promo, where Sean died, you know, and I just said, you know what, I'm going to try to cleanse myself of it. I need to change in my heart because I'm not happy. I'm not this kid that everyone, everyone calls me kid, and I'm like, I'm turning 30 years old. I travel the world. I pay my bills. You know, a lot of you people still live at home with your with your parents. No doubt. No knock on that, but. Don't call me kid. I'm sick of it. Mm. Like I'm doing more things than a lot of people are in, in wrestling. And I'm, ha I'm, ha I'm not bragging about it. I'm just happy to say that I am because not a lot of people have the ability to do so, but don't call me kid because it takes a lot to be doing. It takes a lot to live in New York for God's sakes. Like it's, it's a crazy place. I never yeah. had to be there, but at that moment is when I decided I'm going to do things for me. I'm I had to find a way to cleanse my spirit because you know, we all talk, we always talk about fighting spirit and wrestling. My fighting spirit was tainted. The taint of that match haunted me because forever I thought I'm not as good as people thought I was. And now I went and had that match with Speedball. And when I went to have that match, I would say, I people were, I would say, I had to get this monkey off my back, which is a double entendre. Yes, of course, it means his song, Brass Monkey. <laughs> but it, it was the literal, it was the And then he monkey. was actually on your back when he tried to yes. break it. It was uh, that's, that's, okay, triple entendre. Yeah. <laughs> How dare you? It's like right. an onion. There's just layers. <laughs> but I think about it this way. He did that double knees on my back, but that match is probably one of the best matches this year, and I'm, I will have yeah, yep. Definitely. But, but that, when he did that double knees, I felt happy about wrestling again. Yeah. I, 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 I was oh, telling yeah. you before, I said, I said, Steve Ball's going to be the match that cleanses my soul again. And I feel good about myself again, because even at MLW, I you know, I'd have pretty good matches. You know, it's fun, and everyone likes me. Everyone says I'm doing great. You know, in terms of being a character on screen, working with cameras, every working with everybody, they're like you're getting better and better and better. But as, after I had that match with Speedball, I finally feel like I'm in the element again. Yes. Like when Alec Price comes out, he's Alec Price. You know, he's mm -hmm. fucking loud. He's in the zone. When I came out for this last MLW tapings, I felt in the zone again. And I haven't felt in the zone for a long time. Even at Circle Six, I felt in the zone. I felt like I felt like, you know, my idol. I felt like one of my heroes, which I don't have heroes much anymore. I, I believe heroes are just a target for me to, to conquer. Mm -hmm. But Alex Colon was, you know, Mr. Three P. Mm -hmm. He was the G. He was the tournament guy. I came out at that Circle Six tournament. Sitting, being honest about who I was, calling motherfuckers who they were, and feeling good sure about it. Sure did. <laughs> but I came out of that as the tournament guy. I watched that tournament back, and I said, none of you motherfuckers can touch me. Yep. And it oh, all yeah. started from that when I said that from Tremont. I decided to change my name. I decided to change everything. And I finally hit that <laughs> evolution that I needed to hit. 
And I've been I've been walking out like people are saying people have been saying like something is changing you again and it's good. And I it's just in time because now I'm going to Japan and I'm going to face Masashi Takeda. The mm-hmm. like the guy in death matches, but also as everyone has been saying for the past three years, he he's the Eastern counterpart to me. Like I look in the mirror, I see a little bit of him and I bet money when he looks at me, he sees a little bit of me. It's literally like two sides of the same coin. Mm-hmm. And I'm, people are saying, what about the scissors? What about the pigeon spikes? And once again, I, I like to think I'm a regular normal human being. But when I said that, I go, let's go. <laughs> Yeah, because I'm because if you've if you've ever seen Ishikawa versus Takeda from like what was it 2014, uh, the BJW Deathmatch Championship, Ishikawa headbutts the living piss out of Takeda, and if anybody knows me, I love to head be, headbutt people just like that. I'm gonna knock him back to 2014 because mm. I'm sorry, nobody in my generation has pushed him that far. Drew Parker has, but Drew Parker also came before us. Drew Parker was doing his stuff in BJW, but you know, before the current crop of deathmatch guys, mm-hmm. he's been doing it longer. It's just the truth of it. I'm talking my generation, and a lot of my, a lot of my generation that came out in 2020 and 2021, they either shot themselves in the foot, canceled themselves, or just and just turned out to be giant pieces of shit. Yeah, and There's... I'm also done tying myself down to pieces of shit. I don't vouch for people anymore. I don't. I have to know you, know you. Mm-hmm. And honestly, one of the few people I can say that about is probably people like Kid Bandit. Who people will say shit about Kid Bandit, but I go, you know what? At the end of the day, I know Kid Bandit's a good fucking person. At the end mm-hmm. of the day, I know people like Effie are good people. I can't say the same for a lot of you. I've changed so much as a, as a person this this year alone, and I I don't feel it until we have a conversation about it like this, or when I'm at I was at a show was like a week and a half ago. And someone, we had this a conversation about like a past relationship that I had and about my feelings. And we were just talking. And but when they stopped, they looked at me and go, You've changed a lot in four years. And I said, Hopefully for the good. And he goes, Very for the good. He's like, You're not, you know, loud and outspoken, just be loud and outspoken. He's like, You're very methodical and you're very well spoken. Mm-hmm. And people don't think that about you until you speak. And I said, Well, we're only here in this world to grow and be good to people. Like I'm never not going to try to be a good person to people. I may not trust people as much anymore because pro wrestling makes you not trust people because people are crazy. Yeah. But I can still say at the end of the day, I still put my best foot forward to help people when I can. I'm never not going to say no to helping someone if they ask or talking to someone unless, you know, they're absolute. I it's, outright knowledgeable that they're dirt bags and i'm like yeah uh, brother i don't yeah. know i don't know man uh, it's selective ask, about yeah it's like yeah, so, maybe, you know, maybe go ask him <laughs> yeah 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 you you know there's you know there's the like let's you know there's the help your you know help your friends yeah. help your peers and stuff but like also selectively on like on the the ones that are worth helping yeah. and giving that mm-hmm. i've matured on a personal and on a personal and professional level um that i don't think people are ready for especially when it comes to um financially people think i'm just you know spending money i'm like no i don't want to spend money i'm not cutting you a deal because you knew me five years ago i'm like i am here to make money i'm here to retire one day and people look at me a little different i said listen i don't knock people that are doing this for their fun like i I remember uh you guys you guys know like brutal bob evans Mm-hmm. Um, so I did a seminar with his in like in my first year and he said, there is nothing wrong with being a 40 miler. There's nothing wrong with it. Own it, but don't knock people who are actually going out and working hard and asking for money because they've earned it, but also vice versa. Don't knock the 40 miler who, who's happy doing just that. They want to do, they want to wrestle once or twice on the weekend or maybe once a month and they're happy. Um, and so when I tell people that I tell people, I'm like, listen, I'm here to make money. I'm here. I want to retire one day. I don't want to just say I'm retired. Take my boots off in the middle of a ring with 40 people. You know, and <laughs> if there's people that do it and, you know, kudos to you. But, you know, as Matt, you guys know, Madman Pondo, Pondo always says, you didn't retire. You just quit. You're retired. <laughs> you're retired when you have money in your bank deposit from right. wrestling. And that's it. Mm-hmm. Like if Becky Lynch just quits tomorrow, she retired. <laughs> yes, yes. If, if Joe <laughs> down the street and in Brooklyn takes his boots off 
in front of 20 people, he just quit. <laughs> it's not the same thing. I would like to say one day I retired. Toshiaka Kawada retired. You know, mm. it, it, it's that difference. Um, and But there, there's always that weird disconnect of people in wrestling, promoters, wrestlers, whoever, they're, they're very sensitive to the fact that some people just want to make money and some, and some people aren't just going to put up with the dr- dramatics of the game. Like wrestling's a circus, we all know. But um, sometimes we make it a circus. Other wrestlers, other promoters, other people, sponsors just make it a circus. And on a professional level, I can safely say when people try to make it a circus for me, I go, don't care, done, bye. Because we don't have to. Like you guys and myself, we're all independent. We're independent contractors. You know, Mm -hmm. even some of the MLW, I I could probably just be like, I don't want to do that. And they'll listen to me. It's crazy. I've heard so many things about you know, the culture in that, in this area, but things have changed. Like we're doing a joint with, show with new Japan coming up mm-hmm. and be, because I, I talked to people, I invested in myself. I sat there, I sat there and emailed back and forth with, uh, with people in, in the office regarding it about what, what they were doing with me, what I wanted to do about my background. Um, I got what I wanted out of it and people are still shocked that, you know, I'm getting the things that I'm getting. And I'm like, I, I asked, like they said, Hey, you, um, you can't do this. You can't work for this certain company. I said, yes, I can. Here's the exact reasons why I can. And they go, okay, yeah, you can. Cause that mm. makes sense. And I go, see, it's not that hard. It's, I, I, this isn't a knock on people who are younger either, because I had to, I had to go through life. I had to work at a factory and understand business. And I had to, I had to shack up with a crazy Russian to get to this level of thinking but a lot of it come with the kid mentality of, oh, paper, sign paper. Oh, wow, I'm not happy now. And it's like, you're a business. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, I, I do stuff at the fallout shelter. I'm technically a coach. And I say, and I'm like, you are a business. You represent yourself. The merchandise you put out, the, the theme music that you use, the way you interact on social media, it all adds up to the representation of your business. It's not just you're a wrestler. It's you are everything. If you're trying to be something out of this, that's, I mean, that's the reason why the young bucks are, you know, multimillionaires before a major company. It, yeah. And, and I'm just, I'm thinking about it and I'm, I'm like, it's crazy that it, it took, it took this year changed to the point where I'm having this kind of conversation with people about business. Like I was, I was sitting there talking with Effie about merchandising on, uh, on Sunday. And I'm like me a year ago, would be like t-shirts that's it you know mm-hmm. <laughs> and which I, I went to college for corporate and marketing relations but i never really thought about it on a intricate level like that we were, we were having conversations about merchandising production where things get produced and i'm just like when you talk to people who are really doing something mm-hmm. and are actually profiting it clicks in your brain on a higher level and you're like god this is the most stimulating conversation ever and I'm sorry, not a lot of uh, a lot of the people in this area and in pro wrestling. A lot of them are kind of our our kids, so they're not going to have that. Which, when I first started, I was 25, I, so I was still pretty much a kid. But now I'm like, I'm around all these other kids, all these actual children, and I'm like, huh. I'm talking with adults now, and I feel like an adult, and I feel old. <laughs> <laughs> feel Very true. Really Very true. You talked about MLW. Please talk to us about working with Raven. I'm just so interested on in how it is to work with Raven. <laughs> um, so Raven is literally like the crazy uncle that you yes. like to see at um, family reunions. Um, mm-hmm. So obviously, like Ray, he, like he's really cool. If he if he if he fucks with you, he's really cool with you. Mm-hmm. And I didn't know how he was going to perceive me, but he's like he he told me like on the first day he's like you have a cool look. You're eager. You're willing to learn. You listen. He's like, you already have all the tools. He's like, your body's going to get better. Your work's going to get better. And he's like, and your work's not bad already. And I'm like, okay. And this was like in January, February, whenever mm-hmm. he, de- he debuted. Um, but like it's sitting with him when, he, when he's there. Uh, it's like sitting there with that uncle. You know, you just sit there and you just talk. He tells jokes. Sometimes they're corny. You laugh. But he's also – very 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 we all know he's very wise Mm -hmm. we all know he's wise but we also know that you know 
he's been put through the ringer in in wrestling, you know. Um, but you can see him when he has a really smart idea, and he's sitting there and he's looking up, not to ignore you, but he's grasping that idea that he's going to give you, and he's going to tell you, and you're going to go, "Oh shit, that's so smart." Um, because once again, he's been hitting the head a lot. I mean, I've been hitting the head a lot, but so I understand. Like it's, he's one of the smartest guys, but he's got to be patient for with him because when he when he's thinking, it takes some time. And when he does get that idea for you, you're going to feel like, oh, my God, this is what's going to get me to the next level. In terms of promos, like, we sat there and we cut promos in the back. And, uh, like, once again, we, we've all seen my work. I've always been more of a work rate guy. I've never been much of a promo guy. This year has kind of changed that because I've been cutting promos. People go, that was really good. And I go, mm-hmm. thanks, Raven. Like, literally, thanks, Raven, and thanks, um, RSP. Because I went into MLW knowing I have to cut a promo. And I'm eloquent. I know I can talk. But it's different in terms of illustrating that in a professional wrestling sense. Right. That's like when you listen to CM Punk talk, CM Punk has a cadence and a way of – he's not just blurting out a ton of information. He slows down. He gives stops where people can stop and think onto his words. You You know, like love him or hate him. When he came back to collision, tell me when I'm lying. That was like the key phrase of the entire thing. But he's mm-hmm. t- 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 was it like, tell me when I'm telling lies. And it sticks in your head. Yeah. And I realized, too, by listening to him and Ricky talk, like, I don't like hokey pro wrestling promos. Mm-hmm. It's, you know, it's not anything against them. You know, but I don't like cutting them because I feel gross when I cut them. I feel like a '80s corporate tool, and I'm like, "Ugh, what the fuck?" <laughs> but when you listen to guys like Kingston talk, you know, you when you listen to guys like Bret Hart talk, people will say stuff about Bret Hart's promo work. But when Bret Hart talked, it felt real. It didn't feel okay. like fake. Um, you know, when Mox talks, you know. And the, the interlap between that guy and I is going to haunt me for the rest of my freaking career. Shut up. He wore that thing on TV just, and everything. Well, mm-hmm. it's, just like, it's just like when uh, when Masada went crazy this like past week. He went, after, he went after two people. He went after Mox and he went after me. And mm-hmm. I'm sitting here. I'm doing this. And I think my uh, Mox is just like, just don't interact with them. I go, why is it always us two? It's always the most insane shit. It's us two. And she just laughs and goes, I don't know. And I go, like, I wish. I'm like, w- when I'm dead, I'm going to talk to God and be like, listen, we need to talk. This, this, shit's, this, this shit's corny. <laughs> but You were playing some jokes, sir. Uh, yeah. yeah. I, was like, I was like, the interlap here is hilarious. But um, so when I started cutting promos, I had to, I, like, and I still do it now. Like, um, I'll cut one promo, like, first and I'm like, all right, hold on, pause. I'll stop and I'll think. Just be real. Mm-hmm. And now, like, so I think the biggest compliment I've ever gotten from Raven, you know, he said, you know, he's like, dude, you're improving. You look like a star. But when he said, I kind of, pr- I kind of promo, and he goes, that was so eloquent. I was like, tapped out. I'm done. Anyone mm-hmm. who said I was never a promo guy, fuck you. But now I go in and I cut promos and like. A minute, like I'm, I'm in and out. You know, I, it doesn't take me forty tries. You put me in front of a live audience. That's where you get the Tremont promo. You know, where I'm just, I'm off the cuff and I'm going, and I'm understanding more and more how to be that guy to talk in front of a live studio audience. So talk, you know, in front of a camera, because that's what's going to get you. Like I can have the, I can have the most brutal matches, which I do. Without death mat, without weapons or with weapons, I'm going to go out there and I'm going to make you uncomfortable. That's what I live to do. But the promos and Mancer's, you know, if you talk to Mancer, Mancer's always talking about promos. But I'm I understand now what he means because the promos get get you to that next level of investment. Because then when you cut the promo, they're already there for the match if they believe it and they care. Like when I cut that stuff about Tremont after the Tremont match. People were were shocked, and I I was so happy to hear that people were so conflicted. They were like, "That was so good. Did he turn heel? What was that?" That's what I want to hear from people. I want I want people to be lost in the lost in the sauce, if you will, 
of pro wrestling and I'm I'm finding that niche because when it's like when Eddie Kingston cuts a promo, you're like, God, he I think he hates that dude. Right. When he's cutting yeah. the punk promos, you were like, he hates that dude. Mm-hmm. Or, it make, or yeah, or it makes him believe his words like or him and Mox when they were when they were going back and forth and spitting fire. I was like, that's the kind of guy I want to be. Um, and that's because of Raven. Because Raven had this very had had and still does have this very because he still cuts a great promo. Once, yeah. once he gets in yeah. once he gets in pocket, he goes. Mm. But he has this way of mixing that old 80s and 90s hokey BS, but making and mixing it with that 90s, 2000s realness. Whereas now guys like Kingston and Punk and Mox. Homicide, all these guys, they cut, they're more not on the hokey side. They're just straight up, you know, I'm just talking shit to you. Right. Like we hate each other. Um, and I'm, I'm just, I'm safe to say I'm happier to be on that side. I don't want to cut promos exactly like Raven because once again, Raven was in that perfect middle of 80s and 90s guy. Mm-hmm. He had that 90s character that people were like, that's real. But he also was a funny 80s. He, he'd do some hokey and silly shit. But that's what was so great about him at that time because no one else was doing that. Right. Yeah. Um, but I'm happy to say that because of him um, and being around him and his influence, I cut promos. I like that. Like that the promo I cut for when I, uh, I challenged when Masha challenged me for uh, uh, courage pro, you know, mm. yeah. I cut that promo and the guy who filmed it looks stop. He looks, he goes, damn, that was good. And I go that it's, it's almost like when people say your match was great, you're like, it's that same level of in, influential pride. You're like, oh, God, yeah, I'm feeling good about myself. Because once again, not many guys can cut a good promo. It's, hi, right. I'm this person. I'm going <laughs> to, I don't like you. I'm going to see you at this state at Prestige or some mm-hmm. whatever place on the state. And I'm like, I, I'm not going to cut promos for every freaking match because I also believe, you know, if you, you can overstay your welcome and you can give too much. True. Um, but when the matches matter, and you cut the, and you cut the promo, or you do the crazy move that people don't see you do, it makes people much more uh, surprised by it. Like when I pull out, like when I was I wrestled Dale Patrick's in Chicago, and I pulled out uh, Manami Toyo's uh, uh, star drop move, and I was like, "What? What?" And I'm like, "Yeah, I can do it. I just don't want to do it often because I really don't trust people to do it." Mm-hmm. Or when I was blowing at NGI and I did the Fra- uh, the reverse Frankensteiner, people were amazed that I did it, and I'm like, I can do all these things. I just, it's not really what I want to do. That's not how I want to present. But when I do it, it's gonna ca- catch your attention. I think we, people, we, you know, we, you always hear that phrase um, from like veteran wrestlers of slow down, do less, and I'm understanding why because you do less so that when you do a little bit more. People are really shocked by it. It's almost like right. it, it's, it's it was like when you're a bad boyfriend or a bad girlfriend, you set the bar so low so that when you go a little bit above it, they're like, "Baby, that's amazing. I love you." And you're like, mm-hmm. "Yeah." With John Cena, you know that clip of John Cena doing the suicide dive this week. They're like, "That man just pulled out right. a suicide dive or a Rana." It's like, so yeah. he know he, it's so he lets you know that he can do it, but then he doesn't have to do it ever again. <laughs> Mm-hmm. And yeah. it mattered because he was right. He was at the most. It was in the hottest program with CM Punk. Why wouldn't you? It's your most hated opponent. Pull out all the stops. Do that That's- in your wrestling. Don't do that in your relationship, though. That's called weaponized incompetence. Yeah, don't don't do, that. <laughs> don't do a reverse Frankensteiner to your loved ones, please. No, no, no. <laughs> please do not. Also, that. Yes. Don't try this at home. Especially not that. <laughs> don't 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 eat light tubes and spit it in your girlfriend's face. No. Which no. I think I've actually done. But, uh, yes, in a wrestling ring, I got paid. I, yeah, that, that's I, you know, unless you and your girlfriend are booked in a death match against each other, in which exactly. case then it's like you know, <laughs> I've had it. You're both just at the office. Exactly. Put skewers yeah. in their head. It's it's exactly that. Yeah, but mm-hmm. that's I mean, one off on a tangent, but that's Raven. Raven rules. Um, yeah. When he's around. You you learn something if you shut up and listen. If he's just telling a story, you can glean something from it. I I I plead to people go watch it. What was it? His Ring of Honor shoot video that he did. Mm-hmm. It's like an hour and a half, two hours. When I first started wrestling, 
Uh, that's I, I listen to that religiously. And now, now, five years later, I truly understand it. But also, me, when I was five years old watching ECW, watching Raven, I'm like, this is insane. Yeah. <laughs> from there to where you are now, it's pretty crazy, ain't it? Yeah, fr- from being the middle of nowhere in Indiana, Delphi, for Indiana, which is Delphi, Indiana, which is where Dick the Bruiser is from, to watching ECW tapes, to being here and being like one of Raven's proteges is why it's insane to me. My like my dad got back into wrestling because of me and he's like, Your team with Raven, that's so cool. What yeah. the hell? <laughs> right. Oh, that's gotta be that's gotta be an awesome. Oh, it, it's yeah. I think my dad finally understood. He's like, okay, my kid's actually, you know, doing something with this wrestling stuff. Like right. I, I just told him today, yeah. I was like, hey, I'm flying to Japan tomorrow. And he goes, My dad my dad was like, Oh, good. Have fun. <laughs> he's like, right. he was surprised. Yeah. Like, oops. Everything's okay. Everything's fine. Right. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, uh, there's that. <laughs> <laughs> like, Dewey just food me. Shout out to Raven. Yeah. <laughs> Wait, when you're when you're seeing the other, this is like, did you eat this food me? <laughs> Yeah, maybe. maybe. I don't um, remember. Sorry, sorry, can't can't t- can't talk right now. Doing a podcast. Can't talk. Um, can't talk. Yeah, no, yeah, 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 no. <laughs> yeah. I don't. I don't know. Did you guys hear the sharpening of a knife? You know why? Mm. Yeah. Mm. Oh, oh, Dan, did you do? Did you do the uh, the the ate someone's lunch out of the office fridge, but at home with at home with roommates? Mm-hmm. Maybe. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Maybe a little bit. It'd be like that. It'd be Look, like I, that. I'm not in court. I don't have to say yes or no. True. <laughs> right. Look, what are you, a uh, cop? Look, <laughs> hey, cap, bro. For, for 40, it's the 48 hour rule. If it's been there for 40, it, it, no, it's, uh, it's fair game after 48 hours. Oh. Hey, there you go. No, Megabyte Ronnie tweeted about it earlier today. It's like, you know, at what point <laughs> at, at what point is it like okay to eat my partner's leftovers? And it's like you can't 40, leave food in the in 40, Megabyte Ronnie's refrigerator. That's your no, personal mistake. But like well, that man just eats. That man's built yeah. like a brick shit house. It's right. Uh, it's, but like for for it's the 48 hour rule. Like if it, you know, if if you put something in the fridge that you know, with the expectation of no one else eating it and it's there for more than two days, then like you didn't prioritize it well enough for me to respect leaving it alone. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> like, so, I'm still probably gonna die, but thank you, thank yeah. you, thank you for the kind words. <laughs> mm. it, it's a, it, it's okay. Look, me, Reg, and everyone who's watching this will know what happened. So yeah. uh, you got plenty of witnesses. Got, you know, I've you're got, good. I got incriminating evidence. I hope yeah, that exactly. last meal was worth it, Akira. I hope it was worth it. Yeah, it was. <laughs> it was. It was. Bro, it was go. Popeyes. It, it's always. Worth oh, okay. Yeah, yeah. No, oh, that's right. Okay. There you go. That's all you have to <laughs> Absolutely. say. Absolutely. All you had to say. Shit, I might pick that if I had the choice for my last meal. <laughs> <laughs> Bring some Popeyes. It'll work. Oh, oh, nothing I'm beats. Fine. Nothing, I don't care. nothing beats a chicken sandwich. I'm sorry, but mm-hmm. oh, or the biscuits. Oh, oh, oh so good. Uh, so you know, you, you did kind of talk about it earlier. Um, I wanted to go back to it a little bit because you you are going to Japan. For a tour of Big Japan, you found uh, you found a great deal of success in the Big death match world. Um, you were talking about you know like your style of death match. It's you know mm. different. Um, I will say like there's a lot of stuff that you're doing that is not stuff that is like the co- like stuff that is commonly seen in the North American scene. Like uh, um, yeah, you know, a lot of like exposed boards, missing boards, like to the floor through the ring kind of shit is. Uh, yeah very uh you know it is very japan inspired so uh yeah um, you know you're good how's the how are but besides just takeda like uh what is your you know like what's your whole what's your whole tour looking like and who, who do you have kind of lined up for yourself already for, for um your, so uh, right now i know i'm resting, i'm resting takeda on the 17th um and and to keep a first string and on the 18th i'm teaming with remington roar um, and we're facing Takeda and his partner. Um, I'm, I'm blanking, but uh, the, the, we're facing the crazy lovers. 
Yeah. Uh, then I'm there for another week, and I'm on three more shows, I believe. Uh, Sweet. One I've been one I've been announced on. I don't know what I'm doing. One is a free show where I'm uh, in a six man tag with uh, Bakugaijin, which is you know in deathmatch history that's pretty cool. Um, mm-hmm. I'm technically a part of Bakugaijin now. Um, but then I don't know the third thing. And you know if they if they said hey do you want to stay another week I'd be like let's go bro. Mm-hmm. But that, I mean that's that's right now that's the whole spiel. Um, I'm at, I'm in a hotel. I'm gonna go hang out in the dojo. I'm gonna travel around a lot. I'm gonna go hang out with Mal from DDT because Ooh. we became friends when we were in LA after that Circle Six show. We were just, awesome. we, just we we just hung out and we just we vibe and we, he was like Strong Zero awaits you when I got announced for Japan and I'm like I'm gonna die. I'm, mm-hmm. I'm strength Strong Zero. I love Strong Zero. It's gonna murder me. Um, but that's that's the original that's the original thing. You know I'm not like signed to them or anything. But um, also the reception. <laughs> um i was very very happy about um because i've never been to japan you know i've never been to japan never been to korea i know i've got family in both places but i've never ever interacted or met with them mm-hmm. and i'm probably i'm probably never going to because my mom doesn't really like that side of the family it's a whole thing of like uh just inner family politics that i don't even want to try to get into but she just told me it's it's messy at times but being able to go there um and seeing all these fans, like there's been a bunch of Japanese fans that have been messaging me. Um, there's fans that fans that have came to America, um, and they went to it like an ICW show when I was getting booked on them, and they brought me gifts, and they're like, "We came to see you," and I'm like, "My ass, mm-hmm. all the way from Japan." They're like, "Yeah," and I go, "Like, well, let me see if I have it." Oh yeah, this right here, um, it's a Kasai, it's a Kasai flag. Kasai flag, and then they got me a uh, Shiba Inu fl- uh, flag, and they're like, "Yeah, we came all the way to Japan to give you this. Wow. And we, want- we wanted to see your death match." Um, is incredible to me. The fact that I'm getting all these messages from fans, they're tweeting, oh, "Akira's coming! Akira's coming!" I'm like, "You guys know who I am?" Is insane to me. Like when I went to Prestige. I'd never been to Prestige before. And like, this, I, you can be like, oh, it's because you're, you're humble. And I'm like, I don't know what it is. I'm just, this is how it is. I'll go to places I've never been. And when I get a reaction, I'm just surprised. Same time when I went to MLW for the first time and I came out and people were just chanting my name. And I was like, okay, cool. <laughs> I'm doing something right. Mm-hmm. Like when I came out to Prestige, I'd never been there before, but they were chanting my name from beginning to end. I'm like, it's insane. I remember I was, I was, I was in there and I think, uh, I think it was either Envy Young or uh, Sonica was just like, well, you're over. And I'm like, mm-hmm. yay. <laughs> um, but he, this, this fan reaction, um, it feels good, not just, you know, for the professional in me, because it's like, okay, my work has transcended um, international barriers. But on more on a personal level, because where I came from, I was the only mixed kid. Um, when I was young, I looked I was from a Gamera movie, for God's sakes. I had a bull cut, the whole nine yards, you know. I'd be like, oh, Gamera, save me, that kind of crap. <laughs> Bad. Puberty hit me, then a the, little bit of the white kicked in. But I, I, look more, I look more Asian than the rest of my family. Like, my brothers and my, and my sister, are, they look white. <laughs> um, but when I, where I came from, there was, you know, nobody. It was, I was the only... I was the only minority kid for the longest time until, you know, like seventh or eighth grade, we brought other people in. And, but there was never like, you know, any other Asian kids, you know, I never really got to really act, interact with anybody like that. I didn't really get to explore that part of, you know, my culture. People were like, well, it's not really your culture. I'm like, it's still that part of me. My grandma is legitimately like, she came over here with my mom when they immigrated over here. Like my grandma had like a bunch of Korean books, but like one or two Japanese books, like, and I, I could never really understand them because I was never taught to understand it. But once again, when you're not around, when you don't, you get, you, you know, that feeling when you don't fit in, it's like, you are, you are the outsider. I felt like an outsider, like all my life. Um, doesn't matter if I was in a, a group in a club, you know, it was always like, he looks different. You know, you know, I get called every slur in the book, you know, um, when my dad was a basketball coach, uh, the basketball, like the varsity kids. And I was like a fourth grader would give me shit and pick on me. And that's kind of what I started having more of a, you know, like a, a fuck you attitude that, mm. you know, people didn't like, especially when I got into wrestling, I was very much a fuck you kind of guy. Like when I was younger and like people would call me like slurs and stuff, mind you, these guys are like six foot four, six foot five playing basketball. And I'm a fourth grader. 
mm, well, I'm at waist length. Oh shit. They talk shit. I dick punch him. I didn't care. I was like, I hate, I was like, you talk shit. I'm going to beat the shit out of you. I dick punch him. I choked the shit out of them. I remember one time, uh, so this dude, he, um, he was like, in, he was a, he was a younger brother, but he was older than me of one of the kids in varsity. And my dad, my dad was coaching. I was sitting there just reading a book. They'd give me shit for reading books for God's sake. So, you know, it was, it was that kind of school environment. It was just, it sucked. And I turned away. This dude said something I can't really repeat on here, but you know, it was a couple things. Um, and I stopped and I turned and in front of God and everybody, he turned away and was laughing with friends. And I just jumped up. I put him in a rear naked choke. And when they pulled me off, he was purple. Mm. And that like, that's also kind of why I when I got into wrestling. I was very, uh, I guess, you know, not antagonistic, but I, did, I, I didn't take shit. And people didn't like that because I was so used to getting shit on from everybody. When I went to, I went to a Christian college, for God's sakes, and I still got that same kind of treatment because I was the metal guy. I was, you know, I spiked my hair. I got piercings. I hung out with, you know, people that they would consider unsavory. And it just reflects on that. But now I'm at the point where in pro wrestling, um, I have people that I look a bit more like me. They acknowledge me. Um, when I was younger, I didn't like who I was. You know, I used to hate being Asian. I used to, I used to curse out God. And, you know, I was, I was a bitter, bitter kid. Um, because I was like, why am I the only one? Like, why do I, why don't I look like my siblings? Why don't, you know, like, why am I by myself? And, then I kind of grew up. I got into wrestling, and I, I, I picked the name Akira because that was a, that was a character when I was like five. I would write books, you know, like little books. I draw the pictures or whatever. I wanted to make like my own Dragon Ball Z kind of books, mm -hmm. and they'd be like some insane stuff. Or I, I, I think I found one when I was like three years ago, and I was like, "What was I on when I was writing this kind of crap?" This is like it's like Dragon Ball Z ripoff, but like. I was like, I, I didn't, I didn't do cocaine when I was five. Where was coming from? <laughs> but I, I look at it, and I, that was always the character's name, though, was Akira, and I took that because I was like, that's it's personal to me. It wasn't from the anime. It just it, it helps in terms of marketing and, and in terms of names. Um, but then I got into wrestling and people would be like, oh, well, you're white, you're this, you're that. And I'm like, motherfuckers, am I white? Am I all these racial slurs? Or am I, or am I this? Pick one. And, but it was great. It's always gratifying when I go to, you know, when I see Rina, Rina Yamashita, she, she goes, Akira, hugs me. We talk. Um, uh, Toru, when he's over, same thing. Um, Japanese fans, other Japanese wrestlers, they see me, they, oh, they sit there and they talk with me. And I'm just, I'm one of them. They don't question it. They, they, they see it. I think it was I, when I did the New Japan Dojo in my first year, when I didn't know anything about working, actually knowing how to work, but I got my entire style from training that whole week with Shibata. Um, Tiger Hattori was there and he said, ah, you're mixed. And I go, what? What? He goes, Korean, me Japanese. Mm -hmm. like, he's like, but white too, right? I go, yeah. He goes, ah, my grandkids like that. And I go, I almost shit a brick. I was like, <laughs> I was like, this is the guy. This is Tiger Hattori. I used to watch like mm -hmm. old New New Japan tapes, and I'd watch this guy ref, and he like he saw it, you know. So now I'm not worried so much about what other people think about me because the people I truly care about the most you know and i want to represent see it you know like people like kid bandit G, uh, ref gina uh kevin q we're, we're every time we're together we're like up oh, asian people what's up i was as the going guys because there's not many of us at wrestling shows we don't, we'll take pictures and stuff um and seeing this fan reaction like it i get emotional every time like when uh when masha went over for gcw um in japan and they were selling merchandise she's like yo there were fans that were wearing your stuff and i just it's rad it, it doesn't feel real you know the people that you know you you want to be in front of the most you it doesn't feel real when they talk to you and when they message you and or when they wear your stuff and they ask where you're at or how you're doing and you hear it from other people who aren't going to lie to you about it 
it's a different feeling. So I'm very excited to get there and show them who I am and bear my soul to them and bleed everywhere. And I'm I'm gonna put myself through hell for this match. I don't care. Like if this if there's a time to go go out in the ring and despite an injury that could happen, this is the time to do it. Because I don't want to go there and just, oh, you know, some people go there and it's like, oh, I'm, I'm in Japan. I'm happy to be here. I made it. This is it. I don't want to be just that guy. I want to be the guy that goes back every other month, you know, whether it's for Big Japan or any other promotion. Because I go for Big Japan, you know, we could branch off into another thing entirely. Yeah. And just the fact that there's fans that are buying tickets specifically to see me is, once again, it's a level of gratification to everything I've done in five years that, I have not felt in all of five years until now, actually. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, so before we wrap things up, we, uh, we, we, you've mentioned her a few times and I'd be remiss, uh, you know, I'd be remiss if I didn't ask you about her. Uh, I, you know, I happened to see your first MLW middleweight title defense here uh, at a show you referenced earlier here in my hometown, uh, Hamilton. Mm-hmm. So you, you wrestle Masha for the uh, middleweight title. Awesome yes. match, amazing grappling. I would, you know, I, I, I was, I was just sitting there going Ooh, the whole time. <laughs> but uh, and uh, you know, we got to spend some time together after the show, and uh, it was a, it was a short time, but you guys were very fun to be around. And uh, besides having one of the best wrestlers in the world, uh, you know, to kind of train with and journey through wrestling with itself, uh, you know, like how does how how does how does Masha enhance life outside of just wrestling god uh, i mean if you just looked at my instagram you see the way i was dressed before i moved to new york <laughs> <laughs> that's all you gotta say man like, there you go like, yeah, like, uh, look at my hair did, look the way i'm dressed look at my look did she pick out the fury road fit no that was me oh okay, okay. okay. that was yeah. that, that was a good fit mm-hmm. <laughs> ricky hated it and look, I'm like, and I looked at him and I said, "Ricky, you're you're white and you're from Ohio. You're going to hate it." And he just looked at me like, "That may be true." Mm-hmm. <laughs> but Fatu saw it, Alex Kane, all of Beaumaye, and they're like, "Ooh, you look good, boy." They're mm-hmm. like, "You look good." And I'm like, "Hell yeah, I do." Mm-hmm. <laughs> but uh, it, um, but, I mean, she's enhanced my life in terms of, um, I guess on a professional level, in terms of a physical level. Spiritual, emotional, the whole nine yards. Um, I'm I'm not the person I was a year ago. I'm not the person I was a year and a half ago. You know, we're going on two years of being in a relationship this year, and we've been friends for going for three. Like we became friends when I jumped off the roof. That's how we met. Was through that. I jumped off the roof with light tubes. Boom! It trended worldwide, and she saw it when she was in Japan, and we just you know linked up from there. We just we're just friends, but. Like in terms of the way I dress, the way in terms of you wrestling, coaching, everything in general, um, she's changed my life for the better. Um, and I work, do my best because she is one of the best in the world. You know, I have a lot to, you know, to live up to as well as being in this and big another. And I'd like, to, you know, the past year and a half was a little bit harder. You know, I have good matches, some great matches. Um, but this these past couple months, I feel like I'm hitting that stride of being on an equal wavelength. You know, we're on two different promotions, but we're two of the standouts from our promotions. Mm-hmm. And um, I'd say we get a reaction everywhere we go, you know. Um, it, you know, it's it's a lot. It's hard. It's it's a nuanced thing. It's not a, it's not a simple black or white answer. But even in the ring, I think we uh, push each other whether we want to or not. We we did that CFU uh, match, which is in a cage, and people were expecting us, you know, just to grapple. But when I started, you know, trying to pride stomp her face in, people got uncomfortable, and I said, "That's how we are." You know, it's it's no holds barred in the ring and at home. It's it's all about honesty. And Masha's definitely not going to hold back ever. No. But once again, people are people. You know, people will expect you know the boyfriend to kind of hold back, and I mm. said, "I'm not, that's not who I am." You know, I'm a very nice person. You know, I'm very cordial. But well, when you get in the ring with me, I'm going to hit you. I'm going to kick you. I'm going to stab you. I don't care. Like, it's the blinders are off. Like, you, you, I mean, you saw in the match for Courage Pro. Yeah. I didn't pull back. 
um, I was kicking the piss out of her just as much as she was kicking the piss out of me, and I might have yes. put her through a little bit of hell. Um, hell, she made me believe that match. Um, yes, she did. <laughs> yes, she and, did. She also she also had wrist control on you for like a solid three minutes. But anyway, yeah, then I started beating the piss out of her. You know, relax. <laughs> Okay. You did. You didn't walk out of there with the belt. Still, it was your first mm-hmm. defense. Mm-hmm. It was, and I'm happy she was my first defense. Like when I even I asked uh, Court, I like I literally prefaced it as this. I was like, "Listen, it's not. This is not me saying I want to defend it against my girlfriend. I'm saying this is me defending it against someone who is consistently relevant. This is someone who is getting becoming more and more and more relevant." And this belt needs that because this belt needs to be held along the lines along the same standards of when, when MJF held it. And people cared more about the middleweight belt than they did the world heavyweight belt. Mm-hmm. That's what I want to do. And I said, she's one of the best in the world. It'd be stupid to not do this. I don't care if it's, oh, well, it's intergender. It's like, she's one of the best regardless of that. Yep. I don't view wrestling in terms of, I don't care who you are. Like when I, when her and I tagged against uh, I, our my our now students uh, Cosmic and uh, Remembrand, they like I they weren't my my students, but I got in there with Cosmic and I beat the shit out of her. Like I chopped the sword, and I saw her go, "Oh shit!" And I'm like, <laughs> "I'm not pulling this shit. I wouldn't do it with her. I wouldn't do it with anybody because it's disrespectful. Um, like I wouldn't want to be treated that way, no matter who I was. If I'm in the maid outfit and someone's like, "Well, I don't want to hit you," and I'm like, "Well, one motherfucker, you don't know who you're fucking with if you." don't know who the fuck I am, but two, I'm going to knock the shit out of you. <laughs> and, but she's, she put me on an even more of an understanding of what great women's wrestling can be and should be like this. Like she's, you know, people have said it before and I'll say it, she's the standard of what a woman's wrestler should be like in terms of the United States or hell, even, you know, just the West, the West in general, she's like nigh untouchable. Mm-hmm. doesn't matter. And that's, that's as a woman and as a wrestler on her own. You know, you put her with other guys, she's better than all the guys. People yeah. should aspire to be like that, you know. But I know people can be like, once again, like people can like want to be a 40 mile or do whatever. People can like diva wrestling. That's co- cool. Good for them. But um, it's a matter, I guess, of, you know, people say there's no such thing as good taste or you can't, or, or people say you have to cultivate good taste. That's the same thing for wrestling, you know. Like you can like, Kind of people can like ni- '90s garbage shit. They can like you know uh, WCW 2000 and say it's entertaining. Okay, it's entertaining, which is true. I've watched it. It's hilarious, <laughs> but it's not artistically good. You know, like there's artistic merit in things. There's levels to things, and I'm tired of just saying oh because it's someone's art. It's it's inherently good. And I'm like that's not the case. I'm sorry. If everyone's art was inherently good, everything it would all be in the Museum of Modern Art. But right. that's just not how it is. You watch her. You watch people like Charlie Evans. You watch people who are actually just on an, an elite level of athlete and professional um, professional wrestler level. And I'm like, that's who you should try to be. You know, uh, Chris Statlander is another one. You should try to be like Chris Statlander. Uh, Ruby Soho is another one. You know, mm-hmm. like, yeah. like. Set your goal. I, I, it's not saying set your goals. Set your standards for yourself higher. Because I remember I had a student who was like, "Oh, I maybe want to be a uh, just a champion at my local company." And I'm like, "That." And I went to him. I was like, "That's it." He's like, "I don't think I could be anything else." I said, and I'm like, "I said right, that right there is why you can't because you just set your the limit for yourself." Like when I started wrestling, I didn't say I'm going to be signed MLW. I'm going to I'm going to go to Japan. I said, I'm just, I'm going to do this and I'm going to pour my heart into it. And I will see what comes out of it. I didn't set a, a glass feet ceiling for myself, but I also came in knowing this is a very competitive field. Who knows what's going to come out of it? But I guess I did say one thing. I said, I'm going to be somebody. And you can be somebody and be signed to either a multi million dollar contract or you can be somebody and be, you know, a jobber on Raw, but you're still making a living. Either way, you're paying the bills and you're living a good life. You know, I came into wrestling. I, I just said I want to be as good as I can be. I'm going to, I'm going to be somebody. And huh? Oh, 
I don't know who froze there. <laughs> none, literally, none of us moved to the point where I thought my whole computer would froze. I'm still here. Okay. We're still here. Okay. Well, <laughs> we're still here. Uh, Akira is sort of here. Somewhere in the... That was, that was trippy. trippy. Hab guy. <laughs> that was trippy, Hab guy. Also, shout uh, out Hab guy. Thanks for trying. Yeah, yeah. Guy. I appreciate that. See Hab guy in uh, my friend's Twitch a lot. Oh, there I am. <laughs> Hey, there we go. Mm -hmm. um, being with Masha has opened my eyes to realizing the kind of position that I want to be in in wrestling as well. Of, you know, I'm not just a, um, some random person. I can be someone of, you know, kind. I guess like influence someone that people can come to and talk about wrestling about. Because I sat there with the students. I didn't. We didn't have like a, we're doing all the roles. We're doing drills. I, I sat them all down and I said, what do you want to do with your life in pro wrestling? And they all looked like lost because it was more like a guidance counselor session than a, a coaching session. Mm -hmm. But I, I told them, I said, I feel like this is the stuff that needs to be talked about because who else is, who, has any of the coaches ever asked you that, you know, on a personal level? It's opened my eyes to just being the kind of person I can be to other people, you know, just, just to being in a relationship with her. Um, and just through being, you know, her partner and being, you know, her tag partner and navigating this business with each other. She's done so much, you know, and but by her doing so much for me, she's doing stuff for other people. It's once again, it's a crazy nuanced thing that um, not everyone gets to experience. Oh, yeah. Well. Uh, you, you, you know, you talked about wanting to, uh, to be somebody and I think you're well on your way there, Kira. <laughs> Definitely. Um, um, I, I'm trying. Um, I, I never want to say like, I don't want to be that you could just be like, I am the guy. <laughs> but, you got, you got to be proud of yourself at the same time. Yeah. But that's, that's the thing. I, I never yeah. want to be, I don't want to fall to my own hubris. Um, I don't want to have an ego. But I can safely say I'm doing things that people said I could never do. Yeah. And, you know, it just, even going back to like when uh, you know who was talking to me like on The Observer or wore my shirt and all that other crap. I, I realized it because this is something like Kid Bandit even said. He's like, Kid Bandit was like, he didn't do that for no reason. People see something in you maybe own it for once instead of just being, you know, the guy like, ah, it's whatever. He's like, she said, own who you are. People talk about you, whether you realize it or not. And oh, yeah. this, this is the year where I said, I'm going to start owning it. And that's it. Own nope. who you are. That's, 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 that's the theme of this year. Own who you are and grow from it. Because if you don't own who you are, um, you can never rise above what you are. Absolutely. Absolutely. Say it, but also be it. Mm -hmm. um, you know, on that note, I don't think there's a better message we could wrap up with. Uh, right. So, Akira, before we do head out, uh, you know, where can everyone find you? Plug all your shit. Let them know, uh, you know, let them know where they can follow you. Well, if you look at the little graphic where it says Akira under it, it says at the Akira way. That's not just a Twitter, Instagram, uh, Twitch tagline, which it is. That's where you can find me. Mm -hmm. um, it's also just a way, the way of uh, how I live my life. I, and I'm truly doing that now to this day. I live my life by my way. I live my life by the Akira way. You'll find me on Instagram, Twitter, Twitch, other websites. Um, that's where you're going to find me. Um, you can buy all my merch at like, either stiffplay.com or deathsamurai.com. I got more t-shirts, more stuff coming out. Finally getting them out. And I'll have a lot more when I come back from Japan, definitely. Good, I can get an up, good. I can update this one and get it get get something fresh. Dude, that's that's the OG. That's yeah. the OG. That's a redneck kung fu shirt. Redneck kung fu, by the way, is the best t-shirt designer. That's not Seizawa, but uh, also fun fact. So she um she's another one. When I did the made cure thing, she was like, "Yeah, I'm scrolling through Twitter and." Uh, I stop and go, who's this pretty girl? That's Akira. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm like, that's amazing. And she's like, she was like, well, um, that's my that's my sexual confusion for the day. And I'm like, mm -hmm. aces. <laughs> that's what I want to do. I want to confuse and I want to confuse and, and lose people in wonder at what the fuck I'm doing. <laughs> Awakenings have been had this week for sure. <laughs> yes. 
Thank you so much for hanging out with us today, Kira. Uh, before we head out, Reg, where can everyone find you? Uh, at Righteous Reg and all your socials. Uh, every Saturday, I'm with Philip Lindsay on the Grab City Podcast. Uh, every Wednesday, I'm here with Mike uh, on ND, talking all the best independent wrestling wrestlers, referees, everything you can do surrounding independent wrestling. Also on Wednesdays, I'm live with Denise on the AEW Dynamite Post Show. Thursdays, every other Thursdays, Ask Grab City and uh, the post show of Ring of Honor with Kate. There's probably some other things, but you know where to find me. Oh, thank God you don't have to deal with Sean Ross. <laughs> <laughs> he's he's up there. I'm yeah, going with Sean. He's, up there. he's around somewhere. <laughs> he's up there. <laughs> and uh and then of course myself. Uh every Sunday you can find me over on Love Wrestling on the Brunch Gimmick. Shout out to them because they just announced uh today that they're going to be uh bringing independent wrestling for the first time ever to the Edmonton Oil Kings home of Rogers Place. Awesome. Big ass arena. There's going to be a big ass love pro wrestling show. Uh, so congratulations to love wrestling. I'm on there every Sunday at one o'clock on the brunch gimmick, just talking bullshit. And uh, every Wednesday here, indeed my favorite place in the whole wide world. Uh, next week, Mark Polisell promoter, owner, booker of C4 wrestling is joining us. I'm going, I'm going out there on Friday for the season premiere. Get to see Titus Alexander from West Coast Pro Wrestle for the first time. Oh my fucking Champ, God. Champ is here. I'm happy. Yeah. Watching Michigan, it, someone on their dome. Uh, <laughs> Definitely. I can't. Oh, man. I can't wait. It's, uh, I've, been, I've been wanting to get out to C4 for, for like years. Uh, it is the first promotion I ever talked about on this show. C4 rules. So it's. Uh, and also, I think Mark is going to be our first two time guest. Oh, so. Two time, two time. Yeah. All the love for all the love for Canada and C4. Maybe a little bias on my part. <laughs> but uh follow follow me on all my socials. It's right there under my name. Uh we'll see you next Wednesday. Support your favorite independent wrestler, support your favorite independent promotions, go to shows, buy merch, and uh don't be an asshole. Just uh, just love everybody. Be fucking